yeah. But this is fun with lightning talks. I have a timer on 10 minutes there. Uh, and I will be rude, unfortunately, to people who run over. Because when we're done, the next session starts. So we need to be out in time. because I will not be able to show you about the demo. So, okay, let's get started. Yep. Uh, <coughs> my name is uh, Francisco Izquierdo, or Clonek, uh, and I am going to talk about a uh, GPL version 2 GOIT library. I mean, uh, who of you is familiar with the GOIT database that you use in order to get geographical information from IP addresses? Okay, I guess some of you know that there is uh, a version 2 of the database and that it's impossible to get version uh, up-to-date version 1 files anymore. And uh, so there is this uh, little twist. Oh, since that the creator now is uh, starting to, to work. Uh, you want me to set up your screens while you talk? <laughs> no, I can just try to unify them properly. Uh, sorry. So, Multitasking. Anyways, uh, you know that the, that the version, if you have used the version 2 of the library, you will find out that it has a really nice Apache 2.0 license, uh, which means that GPL version 2 code cannot link with that library. If you didn't know that, well, now you do. If you have a GPL version 2 program that tries to use a Apache 2.0 library, you cannot get them together because of the uh, anti-patent clause inside a Apache 2.0 libraries. So, uh, with that legal problem, the main issue is that once uh, MaxMind stopped publishing new versions of the GeoIP version 1 li the database, it was impossible to get that information on standard GPL 2.0 programs. Like, for example, Direct Connect uh, Plus which is a program that I use. So, what happened? Well, I had never used the uh, MaxMind uh, version 2 Apache 2.0 licensed uh, library, but I knew that they had really nice documentation explaining how the library worked. Uh, so I just sat down for a weekend and I said, okay, let's make this a weekend project. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read the specifications, and I'm going to see if I can get something that at least will pass the, the data and give the data, the data back to the user. So I sat down and I got something working with uh, C99. Uh, it's mostly designed for use on embedded systems. I mean, it's not so focused on performance, but on having a little footprint on the program. And it has this little problem with uh, it needing external locking with multi-threaded applications because basically I have to like read from different offsets of the database file and uh, I need to be able to first to uh, move to this offset and then get the data that I need to read. Which if you are using C99 you know that there is basically no portable way of doing. <laughs> so. I designed a small library using a file-like approach, so you just open the database file, use the database in order to do the lookups or the get the metadata you want, and when you are done, you close it. Uh, the idea is simple, the Kali will allocate using malloc all the data you need, and you have to call a specific function to free the data once you are done. And, well, the main issue with these databases is that they are totally unstructured. So you don't know which data types you are going to get when you send a request, which is hard to model in C, as you probably know. So I have to return some internal data types, in particular a very ugly union one that I am not particularly proud of. But I, have, I am providing auxiliary access functions for some of these uh, usual operations, so that uh, you don't need to focus so much on these details. So what I learned from this project well, the first thing I learned is that the version 2 of the MaxMind database has lots, but serious, lots of rooms for improvement. I mean, it's not efficient at all, <laughs> but it's made in order to make data fit on a really small database. So that explains why they did many of the design choices they did. 
Uh, I know that a, a mapping the world file could be faster. The problem is that some embedded systems only have up to 32 bits, and according to the specification, a uh, MaxMind database file might be bigger than 4 gigabytes, which is what you can fit in the space you have. So this will happen at some point, but uh, I still haven't implemented it. And uh, yeah, there is no portable way of atomically reading from a file at a specific offset. You have to first put the pointer of the file in the offset and then read the data, which can be problematic if you have many threads using the same file handle. Uh, I also learned that you can use unions and void pointers in order to bypass a lot of the type magic that the C uses in order to force you to use specific types when you have more <coughs> unstructured data. So that could be a thing that can be useful for things like JSON parsers. And yeah, choosing a license is very important. You have to be very careful because incompatibilities do happen. I mean, obviously, almost nobody is going to go for something like the WTF PL license. They do what the fuck you want with this code. I don't care. So as soon as you start putting smart restrictions, you will find out that there are other licenses that become incompatible because the, the restrictions cannot be put together. The GPL version 2 and Apache 2 is one case. By the way, GPL version 3 programs are compatible with Apache 2 libraries, but sadly some code, really all code, was released only under GPL version 2 and it's hard to contact the original authors to get them to change everything. So now is when I could show you a demo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess you guys are going to, to have to try to believe me on this. <laughs> <laughs> we can also share the slides afterwards if you want to. Or uh, there is, there is yeah, or I can point you to the. Oh, it's a demo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, well, I'm going to uh, futilely try to spend one more minute in trying to set this. And in the <laughs> likely case it doesn't work, uh, then two, we. Two minutes twenty left. No stress. No stress. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's try. Let's just use a smaller resolution and hope that. What? The resolution. You need to go to like 1270 or something. Okay. 1280, I guess. Uh, so let's go for 800 times 600, you know? <laughs> 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 Uh, so it was here, it doesn't seem to work there, uh, and it's probably not the source. Mm. Uh, oh, no, I use the case. Let's make sure that this is an HTML. Or was it PGA? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 90 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I am prepared for this. <laughs> I, I can move things to the uh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So there you were supposed to see. Uh, hey. So this is a Giga a really simple example. Uh, a lot of it is used boilerplate, like telling you how to use the library. You can see that here we convert the IP address that I'm reciting in text format into the binary format that is usually used used for handling things, and this library uses. Then we can do lookups. And if we just go and scroll a little bit down, you will see that it basically uh, prints the data that it gets from the lookup, or just says that the lookup fails and you cannot get the data. So, uh, this is really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as you can see, uh, this is the little program I have already compiled. This is our uh, server I have in Spain. And as you can see, you get all the data of where the, of where the IP address is, as we used it to do with the old version of the library. And the best of it, now you can also use it with IP version 6 uh, addresses, oh. and it also works.
Yeah, so I was going to talk about um, Podman and Kubernetes. I did a longer talk for FOSS Gothenburg, which is online, but this is uh, 90 minutes in more like nine. So <laughs> <coughs> it's about Podman and Kubernetes, or OCI with CRI, if you're a person who likes TLA. Um, that's three letter acronyms. Uh, so, um, so OCI is then the Open Containers Initiative. And that was uh, spun off by Docker and some others in 2015 in order to make a standards-based way of uh, running and uh, storing containers. So uh, it's the it's a runtime specification and uh, image specification. And uh, when I talked about Podman, it's uh, two um, actually two different um, programs. So there is Podman for running containers, uh, similar to Docker Run, and then it spun off into a separate product called Builda for um, for building container images, so more like Docker Build, and it will handle uh, also the Docker file format. And the name Builda was because the main developer uh, is from Boston, so that's how Builda sounds. <laughs> So the next was um, Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes, as you might know, is an orchestration system built on top of a container system. So where Podman and uh, um, the um, underlying container system runs the, the system, uh, this will orchestrate. So uh, um, Kubernetes introduced this CRI, which is the Container Runtime Interface, and uh, there was an alternative implementation instead of this bulky Docker daemon, there was a lightweight Container Runtime, and uh, it's called Cryo. And uh, lately, as in this year, uh, one of the lead developers of Rancher got uh, tired of the footprint of Kubernetes on especially embedded devices. So he came up with the K3S uh, project, with it, which is then is uh, five less than Kates. So he threw out all the alpha features, all the non-default features, uh, and um, all the um, out-of-tree drivers, so all the in-tree drivers out. And uh, then he um, switched database from the normal etcd back to SQL. <laughs> so it runs SQLite to in, introduce the database, and uh, this makes uh, it fit in a very small footprint. The down drive is less than 50 megabytes. So this is then a diagram of how it works together. Uh, most of you might be familiar with how Docker talks to the Docker daemon, which then talks to the container daemon, which finally talks to, well, not Linux, but another abstraction called RunC. And they explained this RunC program that because containers are actually an array of complicated, sometimes arcane system features, so like C groups and namespaces, we have integrated them into a unified low level component we call RunC for run containers. And then Cryo talks to this RunC, and if you're using Podman, then Podman can talk directly to. Um, a small program called Common, and that will talk to run C. Right, so that was the background, and we'll try a demo. We'll see. Four minutes to see. No stress, right? So I cheated a bit by uh, <laughs> recording it this morning, but uh, it will download this ISO image. And uh, I have this project called Boot to Podman, which is, if you're familiar with Boot to Docker, this is a similar concept. We're using Podman machine, which is then um, similar to Docker machine. So it will create a virtual machine with a new enough Linux kernel that we uh, need to run this. Uh, and then it will set up SSH on this virtual machine that you can then log into uh, the machine in order to run uh, 
well, your basic containers. But uh, the new thing for uh, this new release is that you have a small download, which is 100 megabytes, which gives you the Pogma containers. If you go for the big download, which is the 175 megabytes, then you also get Cryo and uh, K3S. I've only packaged them at this point. They're not really loaded by default, so you will have to load them first. And then I'm, I've bundled the images we need, which is the infrastructure pause image and the core DNS. Uh, so these are normal Docker images, and these are bundled with the download, so I load them from a directory. And here we start the K3S server without the option on traffic and uh, um, load balancer because those are like bigger than the rest of the download themselves. And now it's starting the kubelet, which is then a main component of Kubernetes and what you talk to. And uh, then we can run Kubernetes. As of this point, it's version 1.13.5, but 1.14 is coming. And here is the cry cutter, which is the lower level uh, interface. You can talk to all the interfaces. And here is the process tree on the VM. Uh, so here we can see these common monitoring processes. They handle logging and um, networking for the actual containers, which are then um, the other processes. And uh, we have the cryo uh, monitor and the K3S server. But there is no Docker daemon spawning these other processes. They are, they are directly started. And then there is some other stuff uh, to handle uh, um, uh, dev random and uh, the, um, to be able to shut down and so on. But uh, the footprint of the system is about 250 megabytes idle in RAM and 512 megabytes code that it can run in. And then you need space for your own applications, of course. Well, uh, have a minute, so let's see if, we can, if it's still alive. Yeah, it seems happy enough. There is also a QAMO driver, but the uh, virtual box is still the fault. Uh, so, uh, one other thing I can mention in the last uh, minute, or 45 seconds is that um, Podman now allows you if your kernel is new enough, then you can run uh, containers uh, without uh, without being the root user. So we have something called rootless containers. Ah, that might be a bit optimistic, trusting the Wi-Fi, but. <laughs> So here you have uh, uh, your container, but you don't need root to start it. Instead, it lives in uh, local, uh, local share containers. And you need uh, Linux 4.18 on your for all the features to work. And uh, this one comes with 4.19 in the latest release. Yeah. So that was what I wanted to show today. And you had nine seconds to spare, so <laughs> nobody still leads. system uh, for Swedish conditions and one second typing and talking <laughs> at the same time does not work obviously <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm sorry uh, uh, Freebook uh, was 
from the beginning a proprietary uh, system called GFS uh, accounting, and uh, it was liberated in 2009. And uh, oops. I'm impressed by the bravery of all the guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? I'm impressed by your bravery. Everyone's sort of gone into the fire. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as you can see, the slides are in Swedish, uh, but I will talk in English so uh, everyone who doesn't understand can at least uh, get uh, what it's about. Uh, so, uh, for, as already said, it's the accounting and administration system, so it's not only administration, I need to stress that it's also accounting. So it's uh, uh, that. And you can have several uh, associations and companies of course and uh, you can use it uh, for for your association or you can be a accounting uh, consultancy or so uh, you can of course use it with uh, many different kinds of accountants uh, periods like 12 months uh, short or uh, longer you can use any uh, uh, put it up and then uh, yeah, okay, this was not looking very good, but uh, this is how it looks, and you can see it adapts a bit. So, uh, the left hand version is from uh, Mac OS, and uh, the right hand uh, image is uh, from, from the more uh, GNU Linux uh, uh, perspective, and it looks a bit different in Windows, but uh, basically, this is what you see, and uh, you have all of the many things. So you can have uh, sales. Purchases, uh, banking, uh, storage, uh, and accounting, and uh, of course uh, you can import and export from other systems. Uh, so you can use the Swedish uh, CE format. Uh, so you can uh, export it to your accountant if you want to do the end of year uh, accounting or so on. Uh, and you can also export it for, for doing the tax uh, stuff, so that's fine. Uh, so there are a lot of accounting plans uh, coming with Freebook, and uh, you can also import them easily and change them. Uh, if, if you have a previous year in, in your CEF field, um, uh, it will in file, uh, it will get imported, and the, and the saldos will be uh, according to, to what your standings are. So that's, just yes, to continue accounting in, 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 in it. And uh, some, some quick facts, and uh, I can see it's cutting here, not good. But it's a uh, new GPL3, uh, so it's, um, uh, and it, where it's a Java application. Uh, and uh, it, so it runs on a lot of platforms. Uh, so uh, you can also make uh, purchase orders and stuff like that. and. Uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and if you have recurring uh, invoices, you can also send out those. Uh, so, uh, of course, if you uh, want to do uh, your, you have a store, you can of course have your uh, uh, saldos for, for inventory and so on. And uh, if you're importing uh, stuff from China, uh, you, you can uh, do uh, the uh, correct uh, uh, VAT handling and the, the tax handling for that. So that works <coughs> fine. And if you are a bit unacquainted with uh, accounting, you can get some help with how to use it uh, uh, in the help system, which is very extensible and uh, extensive. Uh, the help files, they are in docbook, so it's an uh, open XML uh, format, so you can do that. So how does it look? Uh, well, very blurry, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a report, so it's about the, the verifications that you have put into the system. And uh, I also want to say something about the, the stuff that you see, at least down to the right which is the I love Libre. 
which is a satellite event for FSCons, which is uh, coming for its 12th edition uh, this year. And uh, I Love Libre will happen now and then, and the next time it will be in uh, May. And it's very focused on practical things. So last time we were doing uh, graphical production, music production, and also accounting. So uh, uh, next time it will be something with Blender and, and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, this is the summary, so I think I'm still in time. Two minutes. Time. Yeah, Plenty so uh, just want to say if you want to use Freebook, uh, you can get it from freebook.org. Uh, if you want to send in a paper to FSCons, you can do that to see if it is uh, open. And uh, fscons.org is the address. If you want to take part in our free emailing association, free post, you can find out uh, information about that at freepost.org. And uh, my company, Free Programmers Indicator, you can find that the appropriate URL down there. So, uh, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. And uh, I'm sorry for, for the battery going flat in less than 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, sorry? The, the dates for FSCons. Uh, I know it's in the fall. Yeah, it's in November. Uh, November. Yeah. And it will be in Oslo this year because we have a sister organization. last night because it's such a cool event so why not uh, search stuff so this is uh, the sonic disc uh, it's uh, like a th oh, yeah, 360 ultrasonic scanner that's how I call it so very briefly about me I'm Dimitris I grew up in Rhodes Greece I work 90% at uh, Selic which is a 3d bioprinting company and 10% at uh, as a course responsible for at the University of Gothenburg some personal interests, embedded systems, software architecture, API design, robotics, IoT stuff that I really like, and I have a blog that I write about my new stuff. So, very briefly about this, uh, it's a sensor module that has eight ultrasonic distance uh, measurement sensors on it at 45 degree angles. It communicates via I2C to another microcontroller or your Raspberry Pi or whatnot. And it can be used either as an Arduino sealed or standalone. So right now I'm having it as an Arduino sealed over an Arduino Uno. So why? I needed the 360 view of the environment for my projects and I needed to be cheap. I didn't want cables. So the next best solution I could find were very cheap um, lidars from China. But then I would still have to find a way to move them around and with all the problems that ensue moving parts. So how the, all these ultrasonic sensors are triggered at the same time and then we wait uh, via an interrupt for their echo uh, to return and then we infer the distance. Uh, so currently it's measuring every 10 milliseconds, so it makes eight, 10, 10 milliseconds, 8 ultrasonic sensor measurements. And it's very easy to build yourself, so it has only almost only through hole components. It has 
those eight sensors, and it has an Atmega 328, 328P, which is the same sensor found in Arduino Uno. Actually, it's pretty much an Arduino Uno connected to eight ultrasonic sensors in this kind of form. Um, so, I use this to, uh, for my little autonomous vehicle projects. So, just to prove what it can do in about uh, an afternoon, I made it park in an increasingly smaller space with the same code. So, it doesn't use any odometers uh, or uh, gyroscope uh, or nothing. So, just by using the sensors, it could manage to park. Um, and I think, oh, it's not over yet. And that was it. So, it's an open source project. You can find the, everything about it, meaning both the documentation, uh, hardware source, and software source on GitHub. And you can read a bit about it on my blog. How much left? Three minutes. Oh, perfect. Two and a half. Oh. So, demo time. I, I would dare to do a live demo. Uh, so, hopefully, you can see this. So, I will connect it. Uh, does it have USB? It does on the other side of our lightning. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so now I have to figure out the. I don't know if it, this is the. Ah, it is. A, all right. So it, the screen resolution didn't help, but uh, overall, I think this is the US number one or US zero. Sorry. So you can see the first. Uh, it work now. Nah. Nah, uh, so the first US zero should be changing as I move my hand. So number one is this one, and so on. So this way we have uh, uh, a 360 view of the surroundings, and it's all coming over right to see. Uh, now we'll change back to there. Um, so any questions? That was about it. Two minutes, ten seconds. We have a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly what frequency does it work at? Is it compatible with animals like cats? <laughs> I, I, I believe so. These, uh, these are like really, these really cheap ultrasonic sensors. It's 44 kilohertz. Yeah, I think it's rather safe. I don't expect them to no, be. No, cats yet. can hear up to 100 kilohertz. So. So depending uh, on your application, it's a good thing or bad thing. The yeah. ultrasonic uh, beam is very narrow, so it will hit them right on the ears for them to... Okay, so it's not good for cats? Uh, they will just move away, I guess. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> there you go, I didn't know that. <laughs> 90 seconds. Any more questions? We can do two more quick ones. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So our next one is Alexander Olsson. Right, so I'm here to talk to you because I ran into a few people at the uh, social event uh, that actually hadn't heard of the Matrix Protocol before, so I figured why not a little like to talk about it. And uh, so beforehand, I'm not actually I'm not part of the Matrix team, I'm just a user and enthusiast about it, so take that as you will. But yeah, so the Matrix protocol. What is the Matrix protocol? It's an open standard for interoperable, interoperable decentralized real-time communication over IP. Or, as I personally quite like it, it's, a, it's a, an eventually consistent global JSON database with an HTTP API and pub sub semantics. So, Matrix. Matrix is a federated protocol over the, the regular transports over HTTP with JSON. They also have a, pro, a, what do I call it, a prototype implementation over co-op and TC board using the noise, flare, noise and flare over UDP, which actually was, they were able to demonstrate it working over a less than 100 bit per second link. A link where it would take over two minutes to transmit a single Ethernet frame, which is 1500 bytes. The protocol is history heavy. Every message is encoded, signed by your home server, and encoded into a global JSON DAG, a Merkle graph, which is centralized to each room in the matrix. It has a built in semantics for end to end encryption using the ALM system, which is based on the signal ratchet. 
We also have Nagel on top of that to do session key handling. It supports WebRTC signaling for voice over IP. So, and it also supports group chat at the moment using uh, the Jitsi system, but we are working on also doing that in, with their own matrix centralized system. But yeah, so who actually uses the matrix? And this is all statistics taken from the Voyager, which is a, I think it started as a PhD project by one guy. He built a bot that uh, moves around the matrix ecosystem, discovering rooms, discovering users, figuring out graph links between the rooms. As it turns out, matrix is very heavily used. And these are just discover statistics. Matrix themselves have the statistics from their official home server, which reports about 2.6 million users just on their home server. Of course, it's a federated protocol, so it's a bit hard to actually know that the data for every server, since every server is run by another person in another group. And you can find all the statistics there on the Voyager, Voyager site. It's actually real nice, you just got a mountain, you can find real nice islands. I, I can imagine this guy got, uh, got a very high grades on his PhD using this data. So. And also Matrix. Matrix is actually it's built to do, it's a federation that they did build a system they call App Services into it. Because as it turns out, one way to actually get into the communication system is to already have people communicating over a, over a client or network you support. So Matrix has the built-in bridges for several different protocols, like you, they, they have an email bridge actually, which is really fun. I, I don't use it myself, but it's really fun. But the, the most common ones are the IRC bridge, which is hosted on matrix.org. You can join any free node room on it. You can join GIPnet, Mozilla has a, its bridge on there as well. They have a bridges, also bridges for Hangouts, they have also bridges for Discord, they have also bridges for Slack, for Gitter. You can just, on any of those rooms, it's just uh, really transparent. You can just join it with any matrix client. And they're still working on several other of these. And yeah, this is a response to an XKCD comic, just so you're aware of that. Yeah. But more, in more of like uh, actual users, KDE recently moved all their communication onto matrix after matrix themselves went to, got into contact with the French state, in this case, Densic in particular, which is the, which is the call it, uh, Institute for uh, Information Technology. The French state employs 9% of the entire population, and they're centralizing all their communication onto the federated matrix network through their own uh, separated federation. So and this is, there is a really, really nice talk from uh, Matthew, the project founder, on, uh, which he held at Foston this year, Philip Dijansson's room, the largest actual room on the venue. Matrix is also used by SURF, which is a project in Holland for doing university communication. Uh, damn it, I had notes for this. <laughs> oh, uh, so, sign, so, Matrix built, is built on home servers because it's a federated protocol. Every user is technically supposed to host their own home server, but that's not really viable in many cases. But, uh, but still, the semantic is every server is a home server designed to be run in your home. The reference implementation currently is Synapse. It's built in Python Twisted. It's actually Python 3 nowadays. They've deprecated Python 2. But 1.0 will be released with Python 2 support still. They're working on a replacement server written in Go called Dendrite. The development is slightly halted because as it turns out, uh, it's hard to work on a replacement service when your current service is on fire. <laughs> They, they, they become a bit more popular than they expected to be, so, yeah. But there, there are some community projects as well. There's Ruma, written in Rust. They're still currently on hiatus waiting for the async IO crate to finish. There's the Construct, which is a really cool C++ project that actually integrates an IRCD and the Matrix Home Server into one, so every IRCD user is also a Matrix user. There's Plasma, which is written in Lexer. I just learned about this. I did not know that existed, but apparently it does. There's Geom, which is written in Java, because apparently people still use Java. But yeah, and the, of course, being, a, being an open protocol and all that, there's also a hell of a lot of clients. These are just the officially listed ones. There are plenty more. There's like, the Riot is the flagship. There's a web-based version on Electron. There's all, this, since it's also Electron, you can run it on your desktop. Uh, there's an iOS client written by a team, I think they're in France. The Android, the Android client I know is written by a team in France. 
There's the Nehenko, or Nehenko Reborn as it's now called, which is a C++ Qt based client. There's WeChat, a WeChat script for matrix written in Python. Gomux, which is a command line type of interface for a matrix written in Go. There's Quaternion, which is C++ Qt again. The Fractal, I know that there was a, one guy from here actually who worked on Fractal a bit, so the known project, they use Rust. You have Cglass with Swift, Spectral, you may, they're in the two clients for you to touch if anyone's running that. I don't know anyone who does, but I, I mean, I love the fact that communities are doing things like this. And I should mention also, there's a, a project actually by the Matrix team themselves called, called Pantaline at the moment, because as it turns out, doing end-to-end -end encryption is hard, even though they have libraries for it. So some guy wrote a proxy that can connect, a matrix through, you connect your matrix client through it, and it'll transparently do all the end-to-end -end encryption for you. So you can run end-to-end -end encryption clients, even if you, they don't natively support it. But yeah, I'm just here to tell you the matrix. You want to use it. it it's becoming really popular, and Oh, I'm going to say, damn it, notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, like I said, I'm not part of the core team. I'm just a user and a bit of a developer. I've done some projects for it. I've done a Ruby SDK. I've done Grafana integration. I've done a, I'm doing the Kubernetes packaging. I know that actually people are running that. You can contact me on the matrix. There's my matrix ID. And if anyone has that question, I think we have some time. Seven seconds. I have a question. Yeah. Is it manager, are those manager compatible uh, clients or not? <laughs> and if I said one. So we, could, uh, we can't get managers on IRC, uh, but we can yeah. get them on you know, Slack or something. Well, it is very, very web scale and it's nice looking and all that. And they're working on the UX, so it's actually, that client is actually really beautiful. I should say also the French government is working on a client that is supposed to work for the French government, so hopefully that will also be... For managers and French people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who else would we need? Eh? Any other question? 30 seconds, be quick. Thank you. Oh, okay. So the last speaker is also the first speaker, the bravest of them all. <laughs> uh, he will try, try to beat his three seconds from the deadline. <laughs> Time, don't like his back. I'm not a part of it, I am totally not associated with it other than I use it because I am a penetration tester, you know, this guy that goes around and says, hey, your software is vulnerable, you have to fix this, hey, your software is vulnerable, you have to fix this, this other thing, hey, your software is okay, but if you give me more time, we might find something else. Okay, <laughs> so, uh, What's Top 10 is basically a really nice project on which uh, we try to figure out which are the most prevalent, how risky or problematic security problems on web applications. I mean, I, I know that a lot of people here is are, are working and doing development. Raise your hand if you have written a web application. Come on, don't be shy. Raise your hand if you, or keep your hand raised if you have used PHP at some point. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably know that PHP, I, I mean, the PHP documentation is really nice. You just don't copy paste examples. It's even worse than copy pasting from a Stack Overflow if you don't want anybody to go into your kitchen. So, uh, this project focuses on the 10 more uh, common or biggest mistakes. They keep releasing new versions. This is from 2017. Previous one was from 2013. So, every three, four years, you can expect a new version of this uh, listing. So, uh, well, this is like the boring, boring uh, list with everything. And here is the, the 10 elements that you should take care of if you are doing web development at some point of time. Some of them might be taken care of by your framework, others don't. Just keep in mind that they exist. So, number one, injections. I mean, has any of you ever used SQL map or any other SQL injection tools? Come on, don't be shy. I know that a lot of you have. Yeah, so this is the most problematic issue because it usually allows you to dump the whole database and figure out the users that exist on the system. 
it can even result on a remote code execution. That means that an attacker can execute code into your servers when you don't expect it. So when you are mixing different languages, for example, creating SQL code from PHP, you have to be very careful with any data you get from users. So let's go for number two, broken authentication. I mean, let's go for it. So who of you has ever just tried to visit slash admin and phone that all of a sudden they became administrators? Good. You see, this is a really, really common problem also. So that's why it's number two, because most often the applications don't handle authentication properly. Who of you has find out a, a cookie called admin equals zero that you can just modify and then become admin? That's another example. So when you use authentication systems, always try to use whatever your framework is providing because it's usually well designed. Well, unless you try to copy code from PHP.net. <laughs> uh, but uh, be very careful because you might find out that, for example, users might have actions that they can carry out that you don't expect them to carry out and that can have impacts on your systems. Number three, sensitive data exposure. I'm going to summarize this really fast. 1177.se. I'm not going to say anything else. So be very careful uh, not to keep personal or uh, data that shouldn't be reachable, easy to reach. Always require authentication before accessing particularly sensitive data and uh, well keep an eye on what uh, on what the uh, map of your application looks like so number four external xml entities this i'm not sure why it's here because of course nobody uses xml anymore we use json yeah <laughs> of course we do so if, if you get uh, if you get that XML data from a user, you should be really careful because it's a really advanced and complicated language. And that means that you can, for example, include XML documents from an external website. That means that your server, in order to pass the XML file, will connect to a server that is controlled by the attacker, get the XML data, and then, well, try to interpret it. So you can end up with very different problems with uh, when you are handling XML. So there is a really nice lib XML version that uh, tries to prevent the uh, system from doing so. Always, when you use uh, the XML library in your uh, web, web application, try to restrict at the maximum what, the, what XML features you allow. And always use a DTV to reduce the risk of these kind of problems. Broken access control. So, we were talking about broken authentication. Uh, here we usually talk about uh, problems with how you handle, for example, session tickets and so on. And in broken access control is more the case I told you about admin. They are kept as two different issues because one thing is usually preventing the user from accessing your system, and another thing is making sure that the user is who he says to be. Uh, those two are, as you can see, really critical parts of the application, so this is usually the first thing you want to test when you want to look for security vulnerabilities. Security misconfiguration. This is a new one, actually. I mean, Raise your hand if you have ever deployed an application just with the default settings you get from your distro or from the application itself. Come on, really? So little people, I know that a lot of people is just side to raise your hands. So uh, as, you can, as you probably know, not always the security defaults that you get in your well, web applications, in your servers, in your frameworks are the best ones. So if you are developing a web application, always consider investing, well, a 5% of your time at the end of the project to make sure that you do the deployments and that the configuration you set up is the strongest one. Because otherwise you might find that, uh, for example, an attacker can just downgrade all the connections from your users to an unencrypted protocol and then mess up with the data that they are sending, just to give an example. Let's go for cross-site security. This used to be number one. Now it's no longer number one. I guess that is because people don't use PHP so much. Now, it is because nowadays we are using a lot of templating engines, so that means that user data is out escaped automatically before you output it. And that's actually one of the best solutions to these kind of problems. Whenever you are getting user data and putting it, and putting it into an HTML file, you have to make sure always to escape the data properly. Uh, A8 is insecure deserialization. Any of you familiar with Python? <laughs> Any of you has tried to serialize uh, Python objects before? Any of you is unaware that two serialized objects actually can lead to remote code execution? 
Okay, now you be really careful when you just realize uh, uh, what was Caled, Yar or something like that. Uh, well, Python objects. Uh, it's a similar problem with Yar and some other protocols. So it's really important that if you get any serialized data back, you authenticate that it's correct, that it has nothing weird. If you are sending serialized data, consider always having a strong hash of the data with a key that you only know, so that nobody can modify it and then get you into an, an, an in, unintended result. But for example, when you are interacting with payment platforms where you get data from the bank that, you, that the user has to send you instead of being sent directly from the bank. That's one of the places where I have found most problems in this area. Uh, number uh, nine is components with uh, unknown vulnerabilities. Raise your hands if you have had a web application that you developed more than five years ago and you know it's being used and you have not update. <laughs> Good, so you know that why this is a problem. I mean, it's even worse. A lot of people go to Stack Overflow, they use copy paste, the includes that they get for the solution. I don't even check that they are using the last version of the library. So then you go to the penetration test and you are like, okay, so, well, you see this jQuery version you are using? Yeah, it has like five different cases of cross-site scripting. So this is a serious issue. And the last one is insufficient logging and monitoring. And this is not a security vulnerability, but it's a risk. When an attacker gets into your system and the attacker manages to fuck up the whole thing, you want to call somebody and you want that person to have proper login so he can come back and tell you, hey, so the attacker basically found out that you were using a really old version of jQuery or PHP 4 or whatever, and that's how they managed to get into your system. So you can actually act on it and you can prevent this from happening again and maybe even detect that the attack is going on so you can stop it before it's problematic. So this is a watchdog then. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>